I can do it. How was that? Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, we can see the screen here, and we will start our uh, event today. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and good evening, Professor Molly. I think it's eight p.m. there in Chicago. Yes. Okay. Uh, this event is held uh, blended here in Nipa School of Administration Jakarta and online in Zoom. Uh, before we begin, I will. Uh, I want to take a moment to acknowledge the importance of our activity today. This international lecture today was held in collaboration uh, with Nipa School of Administration Jakarta and Loyola University, with co-host Universitas Pajajaran and Universitas Brawijaya. My name is Reta, and I have the honor of serving you as moderator for today's lecture. Um, I encourage all of you, whether online participant or uh, here in NIPA School <coughs> Jakarta, to participate in this lecture. And if you are joining us virtually, please feel free uh, to use the chat and Q&A section to post your question or comment. And we also kindly invite all the online participant to turn on your camera and use virtual background that you can get on the chat. Okay. Uh, today's speaker, we have Professor Molly, and I will read her short bio. Professor Molly Malin. Did Malin, I yes, you have Malin? it right. Okay. Uh, she is a professor at Loyola University Chicago in the Department of Political Science. She obtained Master MF from University of California at Davis in 2005 and a PhD from the same university in 2008. Professor Molly's speciality area is international relations and foreign policy decision making. Her research focus on the third party intervention in ongoing international conflict, the role and of the private sector in conflict prevention. And today we will explore a topic of a grassroots theory of peace and prosperity. Uh, without further ado, let's dive into today's discussion as we welcome Professor Molly to share her insight. Please welcome Prof. Molly, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Rania, and thank you to the NEPA School for having me uh, this morning. I really appreciate your, your flexibility and willingness to host this event, and I'm very much looking forward to Amy's comments and any questions from the audience on how I can improve uh, this piece. And so, this is a project that I'm working on as a part of my research lab, which is the Private Enterprise and Peace Research Lab. And the, the focus of the lab's work is to understand the contributions that private enterprise, small businesses, large corporations um, can make to um, building more peaceful communities. And we have a, a really broad definition of what peaceful communities can entail. Um, so we're interested in, in promoting peace, both globally and locally. Um, I've put the name of the people that I'm working with on uh, my front slide because I want to recognize the hard work um, that each of them have done as a part of this project. And so I've been working with um, one of our PhD students, Alyssa D'Amico. Um, we have a Fulbright scholar who's visiting right now via Santiago Sosa, who's been working really hard on this project, as well as with um, Dale Pankhurst, who's a PhD student at Queen's University uh, Belfast. Nelly Cabet is an independent researcher working out of Kenya, and Mike Clausen is an undergraduate at Loyola University, and they've all had um, different really important roles in this project, and so I want to recognize their hard work um, that has gone into this process. Um, so I want to start out with a little bit of a puzzle. And so 
we observe globally um, lots and lots of different efforts that are being made to build more peaceful societies. And despite these efforts of international organizations and community groups and um, political leaders, we still observe countries that um, suffer from violence. So um, not only is it kind of violence between states and so the more traditional international warfare, but we also observe a lot of cases where countries uh, suffer from civil wars um, with different armed groups. We observe cases where of uh, communities that suffer from violence, whether it's Chicago um, or Medellin, Colombia. Um, we observe neighborhoods that are maybe less safe and more violent prone. Um, and so a lot of times in these communities that have suffered from violence or have a history of violence, the challenge is how do we rebuild the fissures that exist in these societies? So how do we change um, to reintegrate people who might in the past have been um, kind of outside of society or outside of um, political, social, and economic pro processes into the fabrics of society, into the economy, and into political processes? And so I'm building from uh, a lot of academics who see war as a bargaining failure. Um, this kind of originated from some research that was done by James Fearon, who argued that war is a rational process um, because a lot of times we have problems like incomplete information, um, uncertainty, uh, misperceptions, which can make it very hard for states to come to agreements. And so they're they're willing to suffer the cost of war instead of negotiating a bargain, um, even though it might be um, less preferable, all things equal. Chris Blattman is a professor at University of Chicago who's who's expanded upon this research and made an argument that um, beyond international wars, this logic can explain violence in all kinds of contexts. So not just violence between um, Russia and Ukraine, for example, but violence in the south side of Chicago as well. And he argues that the reason this violence occurs is because oftentimes um, there are, are situations where authority goes unchecked. So you have kind of strong people who, who have no oversights. There are intangible incentives that these actors have. So glory seeking might be a reason um, to use violence. There's uncertainty of how powerful you are compared to someone else. Um, there's also kind of misperceptions about your relative power along with commitment problems. So how do you commit to um, maintaining peace in the long run? And one of the conclusions of his recent book is that we can reduce all of these five kind of causes of violence by adopting things that promote interdependence, that promote checks and balances, and promote rules and enforcement. And this is kind of the jumping off point for the theoretical argument that I'm going to make tonight. So th the focus of much of this work is on kind of what leads to decreases in violence. It's not looking at what leads to peace and peace might be kind of a separate concept from violence. And we can also think about things that might promote peace um, both at the national and local level. So peace certainly has social, economic, and political components. And there are arguments either in the um, kind of local community um, development literature or the more kind of national political science oriented literature that, that argues each of these components can be um, important parts of peace processes. And so we take into account things like how civil society infrastructure and kind of the, the rule of law or power sharing agreements can promote peace at the national level. But we want to move forward beyond that and also think about how local community organizations, opportunities, economic opportunities, and open political dialogue can promote peace at the local level. So how might actors um, build peace after war? How might, how might we try to promote these things? 
So my argument is that these, the, for a piece to be built, we need to have um, different mechanisms that enable social, economic, and political reintegration. And so we're trying to remember, rebuild these kind of fissures that started or are, 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 are the legacy of former violence. So to have social and economic reintegration that promotes um, interdependence, we need to have social and economic links among people. And so there are a couple of ways that I will talk about that we can help to rebuild these social and economic linkages. To have social and um, political reintegration that um, increases checks and balances or leads to checks and balances, we need to have mechanisms and oversight processes that pro that promote promote both de jure and de facto checks and balances. And so this might be formal, more formal processes or informal interactions among people. And then lastly, um, to have political and social reintegration that promotes rules and enforcement, we need to have state policies um, and political setups, as well as more social norms and procedures that promote this reintegration. And so all of these things can increase the cost of violence to an individual. Okay, so what this means is that peace is, is really built not only at the national level, but also at the local level. And so um, we're interested in seeing how these social and economic reintegration can en enable, um, uh, can have national policies that enable these um, social and economic links, but also political and social integration that offers de jure and de facto oversight and political and social reintegration that offers state and social procedures. And so how do we create those? Um, so there's kind of two steps. One is we have to have peace agreements that create this political and economic framework. So there's kind of a national framework of peace that needs to happen. Um, so what does that, that peace agreement need to look at? Well, we're, first we need peace agreements that address these kind of root causes of violence. Oftentimes the root causes of violence stem from things like economic inequality um, or unequal access to economic opportunities. And so having peace agreements that offered this kind of detailed framework to address economic inequality can be really key to understanding when we're likely to see long lasting peace. We also need to have peace agreements that rebuild post-violence opportunities. And so this is where the reintegration comes into effect. So oftentimes you have former fighters that um, don't have a skill set in place that's necessarily kind of marketable to would-be employers. And so providing those opportunities can be really important for economic reintegration. So our expectations are that the national framework is important, but also there's a, a, a local component as well. And so let me start with our expectations in terms of the national framework. So um, we expect that the social and economic links can be rebuilt under two main conditions. One is when we have post-conflict states that have peace agreements creating institutional frameworks for economic reintegration, are going to have a more durable peace than those that do not um, have this economic reintegration component in the peace agreement. And then second, we expect that post-conflict states with peace agreements that specify different economic reintegration processes are going to have higher levels of positive peace. So positive interactions between people not necessarily just the, the lack of violence, but um, justice as well as peace um, in those societies. And then if we move to the local actors, there are a couple of different things they can do to create the things that we need to see long-term peace. First of all, local actors can help rebuild social and economic ties. So whether we're discussing um, small businesses or community organizations or local political leaders, 
all of these actors have an important role to, to that they can play to rebuild social and economic ties. And this is really important because this creates interdependence but among people. And so when people have strong social and economic ties to a community, they're going to be interdependent with one another and much less likely to use violence. Um, local actors can also um, operate in ways that create both de jure and de facto oversight processes. Um, so whether it's something that's a more formal oversight, like a, a school board or um, some kind of legal framework that enables local leaders to um, have oversight and not kind of unleashed power, or it's more informal processes um, where you have local actors who will make a phone call um, in instances where um, there is behavior going on. Um, these can help promote situations where there are um, expectations around st and standards of behavior, um, which will uh, make violence less likely. And then as also, there can be state um, statewide and more kind of informal social procedures for dealing with or creating rules around behavior and making sure those rules are enforced, which should also reduce the likelihood of violence. So our expectation is that this kind of interdependence that happens as a result of social and economic links is going to mean that post-conflict communities that have more um, businesses that are engaging ex-combatants and that are more inclusive are going to be having less um, crime and violence. We also expect that checks and balances are really important in terms of providing this de jure and de facto oversight and that rules and enforcement are, are important in terms of providing kind of uh, social procedures. And we expect to find that post-conflict communities with more inclusive community initiatives um, are going to also have lower levels of crime and violence. And so I want to talk a little bit about kind of how we're testing these um, these hypotheses. Um, but first of all, I wanna talk about the outcomes that we're interested in. And so we're looking at both kind of the, the duration of peace and the presence of positive peace. So when there's kind of more of a justice framework um, and then when um, we're likely to observe less violence. And so to test these arguments, we are planning a couple of different uh, uh, chapters in the book project to look at both uh, cross-national data um, and case studies. Um, and so Santiago, Alyssa, and I have been working on a project that looks at instances of economic reincorporation and treaties um, to understand kind of what is what is the language that's incorporated in treaties and how do these lead to either more durable peace agreements or higher rates of positive peace? And so um, accounting for, you know, do peace agreements create um, programs for ex-combatants or are there are they um, offering opportunities um, to have startup funds for a business and things like that? Um, and then next, we're we're doing a project. Santiago, um, Nelly, and I are doing a project that looks at entrepreneurial projects of ex-combatants. And so we've collected information on former combatant entrepreneurship projects in Colombia and Uganda, um, looking at how um, these former combatants have created um, either their own business or being employed by local businesses to understand kind of what the economic side of the reintegration process looks like. And then we're looking, um, I'm working with Dale Pankhurst to look at uh, the case of Senegal and Northern Ireland to understand the role of community organizations in rebuilding um, uh, the community fabric. And so enabling both kind of social um, reincorporation and interaction among members of society. 
Um, and then lastly, um, Mike Clausen has been working on our project, looking at community organizations and private businesses in Chicago to understand links between these organizations and um, the likelihood of violence across different neighborhoods in Chicago. Um, so I'm going to stop there and I look forward to your questions and your, your feedback, Amy. Thank you, Professor Melly. And now we have our discussion here with us, uh, Dr. Hidayaturahmi, or we can call Dr. Ami, Amy. Uh, uh, she will give response and adding insight to us to understand this topic. Uh, before I will read her short bio. Mrs. Ami obtained a doctoral in development communication from IPB and graduated with a master degree in public administration at the Australian National University. She has research experience related to pro-green development policy models within the provincial government, digital transformation of tourist village in Indonesia, ecofeminism in environmental pro Preservation in Riau. Uh, without further ado, please, Mrs. Amy, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Ms. Reta, for the introduction. Uh, very good morning, everyone. Uh, and good evening, Prof. Melin. Is it okay if I address you with Molly? Yes, absolutely. Okay, thank you. Uh, this is my pleasure to be your discussion today. Uh, and I will try to give some, uh, express my ideas and also my experience. Uh, and also I would like to say hello to all the students here in the room because this morning we combined the event between Zoom meeting and also in our uh, university here in Jakarta. Very good morning, everyone. And also in June meeting, I'm sure there are a lot of people from uh, Bandung, from Pajajaran University, and also from Brawijaya University in Malang, and maybe also from other uh, cities in Indonesia. Thank you very much for having me today. And also to all committees, uh, especially Ms. Ratri Istania. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Yeah, this is very challenging to be, <laughs> uh, to be a discussion for this international event so yeah i think my role here is just to share my ideas and also to share my uh, research uh, experience and i will ask the audience to also express your uh, ideas and opinion later on uh be my uh, notes here about the topic of uh, the graduate theory of peace and prosperity I would like to highlight some notes from uh, Molly's presentation just now. Um, yeah, Molly started with the idea of uh, from the conflict, the violence from the civil war, uh, some important aspect that she just mentioned uh, before, like uh, how the uh, the conflict itself, the the conflict resolution, not only depend on the national level or for the government, but also the need, uh, the necessity to ask the local level to participate in the conflict resolution is really important. Um, uh, about the addressing the causes of violence, uh, what Molly said about the economic inequality, uh, if I can relate to Indonesian context, for example, like uh, the condition at the moment between eastern part of Indonesia and western part of Indonesia, we also have the issue about the economic inequality, the condition, uh, and also about the how the people from the eastern part uh, compared to Western part doesn't have a balanced uh, condition and also how they have uh, experienced with inequality in many aspects. 
uh, and the other aspect that I noticed about the local art, local actors, yeah, uh, what may what Molly mentioned, but the social economic ties. I, I just uh, I I would like to relate this idea with the social capital. Uh, I will go further with this idea later on in my notes. Uh, as we know, the social capital, uh, like the uh, the participation from the le religious leaders and community leaders here in Indonesia is really a strategic position. Uh, how they can uh, influence the local community to be more participate uh, in order to overcome uh, the conflict or the problems uh, surroundings. Yeah. Uh, I think that's uh, a few of my notes based on uh, uh, Molly's presentation. Uh, here, I would like to start maybe Molly with the concept of the grace theory itself, <laughs> because uh, yeah, I think this is a very important uh, as well to be for my to, for the also to all of us, and also this is related to. Uh, my research uh, experience before my dissertation research. I will begin uh, to understand the grassroots theory with the concept itself. What is the grassroots theory? Yeah. Uh, grassroots theory of peace and prosperity um, emphasizes the role of local communities and also in the individuals in promoting peace and economic well being. Here, the theory suggests. Uh, how positive uh, social, economic, and political change can be initiated and can be sustained from the bottom up. Uh, usually, we 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 rely on the top down approach from the government or from institutional uh, intervention. But here, from the Gresu theory, the the highlight or the emphasis is from the bottom up. That is from the local community. Uh, if you have a look at the grassroots itself, uh, there are some characteristics that uh, we have to know. Uh, I not I make some note about three characteristics. There is a volunteer driven. Volunteer driven means that uh, how these volunteers really uh, initiatively, independently participate based on their own motivation, based on their desire, because they want to change the condition. Uh, and the second thing is about decentralized. Decentralized also uh, become an important characteristic in grassroots movement uh, or in local community movement, because uh, based on decentralized, decision making can be sourced from the community level or individual level, not rely on the government uh, intervention. And the other one is about the participatory. Uh, as we know, how the grassroots movement can encourage the participation of the people with, uh, for example, come from the diverse background, diverse uh, experience, yeah, and diverse interests. Uh, the second thing that I would like to highlight here about the uh, the key aspect that also important in understanding uh, local community level or uh, the grassroots movement itself, uh, I identified about six aspects here. Uh, the first one is community empowerment and then local solution, participatory in decision making, and social capital, like uh, I mentioned before, related to the local actor, what uh, just Molly present in the lecture, and then conflict resolution, and also advocacy and uh, awareness. If we have a look at each of aspect, for example, for the community empowerment, uh, in Indonesian context, if we talk about the community empowerment, sometimes we have a still barrier in terms of the cultural barriers. Uh, as we all know, Indonesia has a strong, it's very strong hierarchical and uh, formal structure, or we see that as a bureaucratic situation where uh, the respect for the auto authority is uh, highly, valued, uh, highly valued. So sometimes this condition, this highly hierarchical, high hierarchy system made some uh, challenging for like 
for example, for marginalized people, for marginalized group like uh, women, children, or uh, disability people, for example. Uh, and also, if you talk about the cultural barriers in communi community empowerment, uh, this refer also to gender roles and norms. Uh, the issue of gender still have, I think, almost all the countries, yeah. I don't know whether in America as well still have a problem with gender balance. Only. <laughs> Same as here in Indonesia as well, how uh, uh, between men and women have to balance their roles, each of them, yeah. Here also uh, become uh, an issue if you talk about the community empowerment. And then about the traditional decision-making process. Uh, I just remember Molly also mentioned about this traditional type of uh, uh, typical in um, to finding the solution about the conflict. Yeah, uh, we have to move from the formal uh, decision making process that only rely on the government into the uh, more advanced process, which uh, encourage the participation, the how to say the involvement of the public uh, in this case is in the local level. Uh, the second aspect uh, about uh, the grassroots movement that also important about the local solutions. Uh, local solution means the local wisdom. Uh, I also would like to refer to what uh, Molly just mentioned in some case studies. Uh, maybe students also can ask a bit more about this to Molly. Yeah? I think this is important because uh, Molly just mentioned some um, research experience, if I'm not mistaken, like from Colombia, Uganda, Senegal, an island, and urban. own characteristic or we can uh, um, mention like a local issues in this area yeah because local issues uh, become uh, can influence how the people how the public uh, would like to uh, involve or have an encouragement to involve in the let's say program or activities uh, and like uh, to to find the solution uh, that problem happened in the surrounding, for example. Uh, the important thing about the local wisdom as well, how the combination of local wisdom and uh, the self can lead to be more sustainable and culturally relevant uh, to develop the community development. Uh, and then about the participatory decision making, uh, the grassroots initiative promote inclusive and also can um, encourage decision participatory in decision making process. Uh, communities here encourage to actively engage in shaping their own future and also to commit to create the peace and uh, prosperity. Uh, the fourth one is about the social capital. Uh, social capital, like I said before, it relates to bridging, bonding, and linking. And if we refer again to what uh, Molly is present about um, the local uh, the local life, finding the solution for the conflict, uh, how the public dialogue, uh, public dialogue can occur if we already like. Uh, have the strategy to start with to bridge between, for example, the two acts that have a conflict, and then we try to find some issues they can bond, bond like a bonding uh, between those two different uh, positions. And finally, they can link each other. And when the linking happen or occur, the public dialogue In something like that, yeah. Uh, so social capital really have a important strategy in terms of uh, how to be, how to encourage the grassroots uh, movement, and also the con the other aspect uh, that I would like to highlight uh, how the grassroots peace building effort works to resolve conflict at the community level. 
uh, like we just discussed now, by encouraging the dialogue, the reconciliation, for example, and also the conflict resolution process. And the last one about the advocacy and awareness, uh, how the grassroots movement may engage in advocacy and awareness. Um, this idea of advocacy and awareness relate to referring to my research dissertation. Uh, uh, I conducted uh, research about the, how community participation can influence the, the, the solution for the river management. If I can mention Molly, uh, this research we conducted in uh, Chiliwung River. Chiliwung River is one of the river across from the West Java until Jakarta City. So the, uh, the length is about 350 kilometers. So it's quite long and a big river. Um, and because of this, um, this river is really, really quite long and also uh, across a lot of administrative uh, level, administrative government level. So even the management for the river problems and until up to now still has uh, challenging. That's why, uh, for, uh, let me explain first about the, what government has done in this um, river management system. Like until 2000, for example, now less than 33 regulations have been enacted. Uh, and also about until 2022, 20, I think, uh, almost 100% uh, double from the number of government regulation. It means that if we have a look how government have uh, intervention in the solution of the river management conflict is abandoned. But why the problem is still there? Yeah. Uh, based on my research, uh, here that the community participation for river management is still need to be encouraged and to be more involved in. Like uh, most of the community feel, they still feel doesn't have any, uh, like a sense of belonging to the problem. So yeah, between government and community, there is a, a big gap, um, if I can mention like that. Uh, also, the other things that, um, become a focus about the how local community or the local local participation really need to be uh, involved in the in the issue of the uh, conflict resolution here i think they also there are two 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 factors in the context of chilibung river communities the first one about the, how local initiative can focus protecting the issue of the river management and also how grassroots movement can invest in community education. It includes the sustainable practices, for example, or conflict resolution skill. And again, uh, based on my research, local wisdom in handling uh, Chiliwung river problems become important things. Um, to conclude this session, I would like to make some notes like applying great theory to like in the context of a Chiliwung River, for example, other issue in the communities need to Im involve empowering local residents to address their own challenges. It could be by public dialogue or by uh, doing some um, uh, like public opinion and also encouraging the community leaders and also religious leaders to be more actively encourage people surrounding and by fostering a sense of community ownership and also encouraging active participation. We hope the grassroots initiative can contribute to both peace and also prosperity. I think that's all. Uh, thank you for the opportunity. Uh, thank you, Miss Ami, and for all participants, uh, both online or here in this room. If you are triggered to uh, ask a question for a moment, uh, we will uh, take a photo 
before proceeding to the Q&A session. So I kindly invite all the online participant to open your camera. And please use our virtual background. We will take a moment to have a memory photo to save for this today event. Okay, we will uh, wait a bit for all the participants to open their camera. One, two, three, smile. The next slide. Keep smiling, everyone. Okay. okay thank you. Uh, we will continue to the Q&A session here in this room and the online participant uh, we invite you to raise your hand if you have a question in this room first i think okay uh, please state your name and your question please Um, this. Hello, Professor Molly. It's nice to meet you. My name is Putri. I'm from Nipa School of Administration in Jakarta. Um, I have some questions. Can you provide examples of successful grassroots initiatives that have contributed to peace and, and prosperity in different regions of the world? What role do community-based organization and civil society play in implementing the grassroots theory of peace and prosperity? Thank you. Thank you very much for the question. I appreciate it. Um, so the paper, I'm going to answer your question with uh, an example from the paper that I've been working on all day today because it's what's fresh in my head. Um, and this is a, a project that I'm working on with Santiago Sosa and one of his undergraduate students in Medellin, Colombia. Um, and we have been looking at different entrepreneurship projects of former FARC combatants. And so they were members of the rebel group that as a part of the 2016 peace agreement received a payout. Um, many of those people took uh, the cash and used it to start an entrepreneurial project. Um, we have found that those projects um, that are inclusive projects, so if they've started businesses that are hiring community members um, and that are engaging the community, are, are having the effect that is much bigger than just their small business that they, they created. So they're actually helping to build um, more peaceful communities and the communities that have these active small businesses that have been started by by former guerrillas are now having this kind of broader impact of um, building less violent communities. And this is really interesting because the way the peace process in Colombia worked was that they had um, uh, many of the the former rebels are were living in camps at least initially, and so those were places where there was kind of a higher expectation of violence because they were being targeted. Um, but what we're finding is that this active small business community is actually creating more peaceful communities. Another example I would give you of is of community organizations. Um, in Northern Ireland. And so these are not businesses, but they're kind of uh, non-governmental organizations or kind of local communities.
healthy groups. Um, and I would say they have kind of the opposite effects that you might expect them to have because the nature of these community organizations in Northern Ireland is um, one that is not inclusive. And so most of these organizations are only serving kind of one segment of the population and they're not enabling society to rebuild in terms of creating that social capital among um, people who have um, diverse backgrounds. And so what we're arguing is that these community groups and organizations can, can be really helpful for peace building, but only to the extent that they're um, enabling um, the interaction of kind of cross community um, group members. And so if you're only interacting in, in a community organization with members of your own ethnicity or religion, they're not actually kind of promoting um, peace in those cases. Thank okay. you for the question. Anything I did want to, I think there was a, a question earlier in the chat um, by Booty. Um, and I did want to just kind of create bounds around what I'm talking about. And so I'm um, exploring peace in countries that have had a history of civil war and have signed peace deals. And so there is this kind of um, already created some level of peace. So it's not ongoing active war. It's not an active conflict. There's a peace agreement in place. But we know that these cases, even with comprehensive peace agreements, are the places that are most at risk of a return to war. And so how do we explain which cases have this kind of return to war and which cases um, have more peaceful communities. And one of the trends I'm seeing that's really interesting is a lot of times the nature of violence actually changes over the course of peace. And so even though a peace deal is in place, um, we're observing some situations where um, it's not maybe a uh, normal civil war that's happening, but um, a shift where kind of the nature of violence is more kind of type violence um, instead of um, kind of directly targeting the government or political actors. Thank you for your question. Thank you, uh, Professor Molly. And I think we see online participant who is their hand. Uh, yes, uh, from Unpat Mona Intan Purnama. Could you please open your camera? Please. All right. Thank you so much for the challenge. Good morning, for Molly and the other audience. It was very interesting that we were talking about the uh, cost conflict resolutions and uh, Prof. Molly were, was talking about the social and economic rebuild. So I think that when we're talking about socials, we cannot put aside the, the, infrastructure, the public infrastructure because it was a very essential for the citizens. So I was wondering how do the government plan to rebuild the destroyed infrastructures? especially the civil infrastructure, such as schools, hospitals, and others? Should the government build the access force first or the infrastructure first, considering both the access or and the infrastructures were equally important, but the, court, the government certainly uh, lack, lack, of, lack of funds or the budgets were cut because of the war and the past conflict. So uh, I would like to ask, uh, which one is more important to build, uh, whether it is the infrastructures or the access first. Thank you. Thank you. This is a really interesting question. So this is kind of outside of this project, um, but I do, I have a previous project where I was looking at the role of large corporations and firms in peace building. Um, and so um, some of the, the work that I did for that book project was um, looking at how private firms have helped to kind of overcome that challenge of having such a limited budget, right? And so you have these countries that are coming out of civil war, they don't have the rebuild the education system and the roads and the bridges and 
and adopt all the policies that need to be put into place. And so that can be, there There can be, certainly be a role for the private sector there because the private sector certainly benefits from those roads and the infrastructure being in place. Um, also, you know, as there's a shift from spending on security oriented things, um, there should be kind of an opportunity as well to see more um, investment by the government in the, the the things that are necessary to have a peaceful society. And so I don't think it necessarily has to be kind of what do you pick to spend money on, but how do you attract kind of international investment? How do you attract um, international uh, donors through foreign aid? Um, and how do you um, manage that change in in the the spending needs of of focusing on security to focusing um, more on kind of domestic needs. Thank you for that question. Thank you, Miss Mona and other participant who has a question. I think I see online participant who raised their hand. Here in this room, okay, please. Yes, yes. Hello, Professor Molly and the other audience. My name is Safira Tesakela. I'm from the School of Administration in Jakarta, and I have some questions. Uh, what are some common challenges and obstacles faced by grassroots movements and initiatives in their pursuit of peace and prosperity? Are there specific case studies or historical examples that illustrate the effectiveness of the grassroots therapy in practice? That's it. Thank you. Thank you for your question. So we're hoping that um, we have some evidence from the case studies that we're conducting right now. Um, we certainly see... Um, uh, implica the implications of our, our Columbia study suggests that this is indeed going to be the case, that the kind of grassroots bottom-up approach to peace building does have kind of larger implications um, uh, for muni municipalities um, that have active um, and inclusive businesses. Um, Right now, we haven't conducted the analysis of Senegal or Uganda, and so the expectation is that we'll find kind of similar trends in Uganda. I would say kind of one of one of the challenges with this project has been to um, get uh, uh, similar data across countries, and so while we've collected a bunch of information in each of these cases. Um, what a small business means in one country looks very different from what people think of as small businesses or entrepreneurship in another country. Um, and so we're we're trying to match those up. Um, it also turns out if you ask community organizations, um, if they have a focus on kind of women's empowerment, all of them say yes. Um, and so there's kind of certain things that I think, you know, some groups think sound good and so they're responding to 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 prompts you know according to what they think people want to hear and so it's really hard to get access to those information to the kind of similar information across countries um I know that in the the case of Northern Ireland um these community organizations are 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 possibly exacerbating, exacerbating tensions among groups. And so it really depends on kind of the nature of the organizations and what kind of um, community engagement activities they're having. Thank you, Professor Molly. And are there any other questions? Okay, uh, in this room, please. Before we have a question that is stated in this screen, what's your opinion on world peace and how all countries should be responsible concerning current situation between Israel and Palestine war? It's from Dini. 
Thank you, Denny. I appreciate that question. I know um, these are two issues or, or this is an issue that is certainly on a, the front of a lot of people's minds. Um, and um, I know, especially over the last few years with the situation in Ukraine as well, um, it's led a lot of people that have been very hopeful for uh, the prospects of peace across the globe. Um uh, it, it's led to, you know, a, I would say, you know, a lot of disappointment globally kind of in the power of international organizations to promote peaceful dialogue among countries and certainly um, in kind of the international norm of uh, peaceful conflict resolution and norms surrounding kind of territorial integrity and sovereignty. And so I, I think this is a huge issue and sure, certainly kind of something bigger than maybe what we're, we're the conversation that we're looking to have at this point. Um, but I would say overall, my, my, my view, if, if you want to know kind of my, my uh, global view, um, I would say it's hopeful. And so, um, I think, you know, in an era of 24 hour news and where everyone is a reporter who has a phone, um, you know, we see horrific things happening and it, it um, it can be incredibly disheartening about the prospects, um, for the future of the world. Um, but that said, um, I'm very hopeful about those prospects. Um, I see a lot of good that's happening in the world too. Um, and, um, you know, I think depending on kind of how much news you're watching, your your hope can be greater or less. Um, and so, you know, I know that there are a lot of good actors out there who are working um, very hard to enable peaceful conflict resolution. And because of the field work in Colombia and Northern Ireland, um, I really believe in those individuals and um, the efforts that they're making. And I see the progress that they're making in the communities where they operate. And so, you know, that doesn't make good headlines. Um, and and certainly, you know, happening um, in both Ukraine and in Israel um, and Gaza have been, you know, really tragic um, for everyone, um, even people who are watching. Um, but I, I think um, there's also a lot of things out there that should give us hope about the future. Thank you, Professor Molly. And uh, please, in this room, state your name and the question. Um, hello, Dr. Molly. Good morning. Thanks for the change. Uh, I'm Shakila from Nipa School of Administration. Like the previous question, I want to ask about the conflict between Israel and Palestine. Sorry if my question is quite sensitive. With the current conflict between Palestine and Israel, there are many grassroots movements of sympathizers joining in various regions that pay attention uh, to the conflict here in Indonesia. Many of them are doing charity work for the victims of the international conflict. My question is, uh, grassroots movements effectively help to influence the conflict to stop while the conflict is very, com very complex and involves many factors. Thank you. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I think it is a very complex conflict. Um, that said, kind of the biggest predictor of war is whether or not two groups share a border. Um, and that's not complex, right? And we're we're seeing that over and over again throughout history, that kind of territory is a, a, a thing that, that people fight over, um, whether it's the case of Ukraine or Israel or um, throughout, you know, many of the historic conflicts that we've seen. And so um, grassroots efforts, I think, can can be really important in kind of demobilizing those um, factors once there's a peace agreement in place. In terms of while there's active war going on, um, I think, you know, grassroots efforts 
very useful in terms of kind of raising awareness of the conflict and maybe raising awareness of different events that are happening in that conflict. But it's very hard for grassroots movements to to get people to the table to negotiate. Um, and so that's where, you know, it, it takes kind of a push not only from um, grassroots efforts, but also from national and international actors to push um, actors to agree to negotiate, but also to agree to a peace deal. So my dissertation research um, was actually on international mediation of conflicts. Um, and I, I, you know, I know that a lot goes into to to even getting people to agree to meet with one another, and um, and so those kind of things that might seem um, straightforward, like having countries talk to each other about how to resolve the conflicts, um, really take a lot of kind of backroom efforts. Okay. We have a question in the chat uh, from Desi Ernawati. Would you please state your question or I read the question? Desi Ernawati. Okay, we have the question in the screen. Uh, it's Prof. Merlin, not Merlin. Oh, uh, it's fine. <laughs> thank you, um, thank you for okay. your question. Uh, uh, so, so this is a really interesting question, and I, I would say I'm in the process of learning more about the Indonesian context, and so I'm really appreciative of Dr. Army's um, comments. Um, to how kind of my theory might apply to Indonesia. And I hope to, at some point in the not too distant future, do um, some more research on the role um, of kind of uh, territory and land and um, grassroots efforts um, in the Indonesian context. Um, but I, I don't feel completely comfortable answering this question because I'm you all are much more familiar um with the 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 conflicts that Indonesia faces. Um I do think uh kind of more broadly speaking, um grassroots efforts often have ties to more powerful actors. And so just because it's a community organization doesn't mean it, it doesn't have kind of more powerful actors that are backing it. And so um, while often we do see uh, grassroots efforts um, be remaining small, increasingly we're seeing kind of uh, large firms and corporations that are helping support these organizations and can lead to kind of a, a bigger outcome than what we might initially expect. Okay, thank you, Prof. Molly. Uh, but remembering the time difference, uh, <laughs> we know it's late there in Chicago. So we uh, maybe ask you first, uh, would you have a uh, few minutes? Or uh, we also welcome you if you uh, stop this presentation. Are you uh, what you have? Um, I can mornings? I can take a couple more questions. Okay. I have an early morning Thank appointment. You very so, much. Um, I mean, I'm also interested. I think to hear from all about how you think yes. this idea applies to the Indonesian context. And I I see there's a a comment in the um in the chat, um, which I think is is really useful, right? And so, how do we kind of think about the 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 stories that we're telling our children even and and the implications that those have um for longer term kind of peace and conflict. Okay. Uh because of the time we will choose uh one question uh one from this 
participant here in this room and one from the online participant. Please. Okay, thank you. Uh, I am take a quote from a Latin proverb, which say, "If you want peace, then prepare for war." Uh, I want to ask, what do you think about this proverb, and what if this proverb misinterpreted by society? Thank you. Yeah, I mean, this is like one of the most debated um, concepts in international relations is kind of the 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 role that arms races have in um, leading to war. And is it better for, for countries to build up arsenals? Um, does that kind of lead to deterrence of war? And um, most of the, I mean, there are kind of two sides of the debate. Um, I think that the findings kind of fall on the side of um, preparing for war leads to war side, this kind of idea of, uh, of escalation spiraling, and it, and it might not necessarily be through direct warfare. Um, if we were to learn from the Cold War anything, it's directly engage um, in battle to um, casualties and a lot of kind of harm done. So thank you for the question. Uh, okay. And we have a last question in this chat. Uh, please. From Pusbang Kaderlan, Prof. Molly and Bu Ami, political and economic element in peace building are important consideration. But I am a uh, we could also take advantage of local wisdom such as satu tungku tiga batu in fak fak in Papua also by instilling education in a very early pace through fairy tales one way to build peace through the smallest environment in the family yeah I think this is a really interesting idea and I, I think um uh, kind of going back to the context of Northern Ireland, since I, I know it a little better, um, I know that there's been research done there that shows that um, children as young as preschool age are able to point out kind of differences or articulate differences between Catholics and Protestants. And so I, I do believe that this kind of really young um, educational approach is important um, because to the extent that we have education systems um, that are inclusive and that we're teaching our children to be acceptant of people who are different from us, that can lead to um, lots more um, important kind of things down the road in terms of acceptance. Molly, maybe I would like to ask uh, uh, not us. I would like to add a bit more about the last questions uh, from Desi. Uh, yeah, I do agree with what Desi's opinion, how we have to build the peace uh, from this very small uh, environment that is from family, because family is the place where each individual uh, grow and also interact with each other. If uh, Desi just mentioned but one of the local wisdom from Papua, I also remember another local wisdom from other from other culture. Like for example, uh, Pileleyan as well from West Java, uh, and also Sipakatau, Sipakalengi, uh, and other words I forgot from uh, South Sulawesi, South Celebes. Uh, this mean these two these two ideas from the local uh, wisdom, meaning that uh, we have to unite. We have to be like a yeah like a peace from to everyone. So I think it's uh, this really can like a bond and link each individual to be more peaceful and always build their feeling uh, and surrounding to be uh, more cooperate and always in harmony. I did maybe. Thank you. Thank you so much. And I also I, I'd love it if if you would uh email me your dissertation. Um it sounds like we certainly could have some kind of 
interesting conversation. Okay, thank you. Uh, like we stated before, because the time difference, uh, it's late. Uh, they're in Chicago, so we really appreciate uh, your time, Molly, here, your presentation, your insight, give us uh, a new knowledge about grassroots theory for peace and prosperity. Uh, we welcome you if you want to stay in this uh, Zoom meeting or you would like to leave this meeting, but we really hope we can continue our project in the future. That would be uh, wonderful. Okay. I really appreciate um, you all listening and organizing this. Um, I'm really impressed with all of your questions. And um, I'm happy to, to talk to any of you about other questions that you might have, but certainly let's stay in touch. Um, and I'm excited about, you know, potential for collaboration between our universities moving forward. Please big applause for Professor. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you Thank all. Thank you very much, Molly. Looking forward to meet you in the future. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Uh, for online participants and here in this room, our discussion is not finished yet. We still have our discussion, Mr. Ami who will answer your question in Indonesian case. Okay. Thank you, Thank you Molly. Molly. Thank good you night. all. Have Goodbye. A Have a good evening. Uh, okay. <laughs> we still continue our discussion. Uh, for participants in online or in this room, if you still have a question, uh, in Indonesia case, especially, you could raise your hand or chat in the meeting chat. Is there any question here in this room? Or Miss Reta, maybe not only question. If the audience would like to share their opinion or sharing their experience, it's please welcome. Because we are here not because we are expert, but we just want to share. And yeah, give the opinions each okay. other. Thank you. Okay, like the lead uh, chat, there is a local community and education in early pace to fairy tales. Maybe some participant would share their uh, local belief or fairy tales that. Uh, their experience in their lay, uh, in their early life or their hometown in Bandung maybe okay uh, there's chat from Budi Fernando Tumango mau tanya langsung tapi microphone-nya diaktif okay uh, please you can Unmute your microphone. Uh, Pak Budi, silakan. Oke, okay. okay, thank you. Uh, still in English or Indonesian? Sebenarnya As tadi. Can okay. bahasa or English? Sebenarnya, oke. Okay. Uh, 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 actually, I want to uh, add my question to Professor Malin because uh, it's, it's not just to 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 divine uh, practice scale, yeah. But uh, in my humble opinion, uh, for for example, uh, for the local uh, co uh, conflict uh, post uh, conflict countries, yeah, they they need to they need some kind of help to divine. I think, yeah, I think some kind of uh, some help to 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 build yeah their maybe their confidence or their uh their maybe to 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 to, be, to recovery from their sadness or their difficult difficulties but sometimes uh when we to when we try to find define the practice scale when we, if we talk about yeah uh uh the countries uh, who donates the the charity sometimes they also bring their uh interest yeah so uh political interest yeah so 
um, the more important thing, uh, the, the the other important thing that how to the how to minimize that or how to uh, uh, to make some kind of a situation that they they will not to give they will not push their uh, political interest in donation don donating their charity. How to to minimize the, the the situation because sometimes they they will try to to uh yeah maybe purposely and purposely they will try to 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 give their political interest in uh, in their charity action uh, in my opinion but but correct me if I'm wrong that's uh that's my question that's my uh uh more more question to person that that I want to ask uh before. Um, okay, thank you, Mr. Budi. Ms. Ami, please give a response. Okay, uh, Pak Budi, thank you very much for the question. I don't know whether my will be answered your question or not, because previously you intend to uh, give this question to Professor Melin, yeah? Uh, but I do try uh, to answer. Uh, if we talk about the political interest related to the charity, yeah, I think I do also agree with you. Sometimes we see a lot of uh, cases where when the people give some donation to other uh, parts, for example, for other who has uh, become a victim, sometimes there's kind of hidden agenda yeah, inside. Um. Yeah, this is quite difficult. I mean, it's like a, uh. Maybe we can say that we ne we cannot um uh, control. We cannot control what their motive when they give a charity or they give donation to others. Um. But here, the first for in my opinion, the first thing that we have to appreciate is. Uh, for the very start, for the very beginning, how they have a motivation or they have interest to give the charity itself is really a good point or a good uh, movement, we can say. So afterwards, if they have another agenda, here maybe it needs uh, what we can say like uh, intervention from others like from us, from academia, when we try to give more awareness to people, when we give some charity or donation, please do not have another agenda or hidden agenda at the back. Or even uh, like for government, uh, through the regulation, maybe government can limit the access if uh, the agenda or the interest from the groups who give the donation is like... Uh, beyond beyond the limit or beyond the like uh, I mean cross the border for example so government have to have a kind of a standard procedure to to prevent uh, the impact of the uh, hidden agenda I think but that is for the very first uh, point that we have to appreciate is uh, they already have a, a motivation to help other people uh, who has a victim or become a violence in one case. Pak uh, Budi, maybe I don't know whether this can answer your question. Thank you very much. Thank you, Miss Ami, Mrs. Ami, uh, and all other participation. We still have our discussion about a grassroots theory of peace and prosperity. Please feel free to ask question, not only question, but you can also give your opinion uh, about the theory of peace, prosperity, or your local wisdom.
Oh, there is someone in the in the screen. Oh, okay. Thank you so much for the opportunity to raise the questions. And actually, I would like to raise these questions prior to the second half of the session. Uh, I'm thinking about uh, the accountability. The accountability of, uh, for instance, like what Molly just said earlier, if there is a foreign donor or there is a, the, um, um, like funding uh, to help building peace in community after the conflict or war itself, and who are we supposed to ask for this kind of like accountability? Or how can we build a system so the funding coming from external or from international is not being misused by um, certain kind of like, um, well, communities consist from different groups, right? Um, how can we address that kind of problem? And how can we sort of like uh, uh, making an argument that this is a very neutral, so it's coming from outside, but how do we avoid the bias? That that's uh, that's a, a one other thing. That's probably my questions is all about. So is there any kind of like um, insight that you can provide us on uh, first how to build a system of accountability by making sure that the funding channeling to build the community after it's breaking apart can be legit enough. And the second one is uh, um, about the the the, uh, the freedom probably from uh, the, uh, the people itself, the community who use the, the, the funding. I think that's all. Yeah, thank you. Okay, thank you, uh, Ms. Tratri, for the questions. I hope you're not question but gives set of <laughs> uh about uh, talking about the again uh, related to the Pak Budi's question about the donation or the charity and and Bu Ratri mentioned about the system of accountability in terms of uh, managing uh, the funding itself uh as far as i know uh for the funding that um managed by the institution like for example from the government or the like ngo for example usually they have their own kind of um we call it like a uh, auditors like uh, independent auditor as well how the money or the you know, not only the money but also other kind of materials from the charity itself uh for example, how much or how many uh, donation coming and how they use uh, the donation. Uh, but on the other hand, there is also there was also a lot of uh, certain donation that manage independently by like yeah we see a lot of foundation like what happened now in the case of Palestine the issue of Palestine and Israel a lot of. Uh, Donation race raising, I think, in among the people, um, yeah, this could be a problem when the, uh, what we call it, the community, uh, the community who collect the donation doesn't have their own standard, but here the government cannot interfere in the uh in the case. So if we remember, I think about a couple years ago there is. Um, a case about one of the foundation that have misused the money because the the officer, I mean, how to say, uh, I forgot the pengurus, yeah, uh, yeah, the committee of the foundation, um, like uh, use the money to enrich or to. For for the private things like buying the car, buying houses, maybe you still remember about a few years ago. And finally, uh, this become um, a public problem when some of the, the donors 
has reported to the government because they see why the committee of the foundation uh, suddenly changed their life of style. Yeah. So here when it happens, government can interfere and um, can do some action to, like for example, uh, akan dibawa ke uh, ranah pidana <laughs> in in the in the uh, low how to say yeah in the low uh, cases for example. But in when the the community or the public do not report to the government, it's become uh, yeah sesuatu yang jadi tersembunyi become selected. So it means that how to if your question but how to create the system of accountability here again the participation of public in terms of managing the donation or the charity uh, in the case of uh, conflict resolution or other problem has to be uh, built in this situation not only for the issue like a civil war, like uh, what Professor Malin says, or environmental issue, what I just mentioned as well. But in the whole things, uh, public participation, local community level in terms of become a watchdog, become like a public auditor is really important. Uh, and the second question, I forgot, Bu Ratri, sorry, but the freedom of voice of the people. Yeah, uh, this related to the 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 aspect that I mentioned about the key aspect of the grassroots theory. Uh, one of the cultural barrier is about the the culture in Indonesia, and especially because it's Indonesia, especially in a patriarchal system. So especially for women, it's really uh, difficult. Yeah, to be more have uh, an active voice. Yeah, and if, if if we see the in general, our culture also doesn't really trigger or encourage people to speak up. Maybe we can use the example if we are in the lecture, for example, when the lecturer asks the student, "Do you have any questions? Do you have any opinions?" I think most of us will just go silent and try to. How to say menunduk, <laughs> because they don't want to be picked up by the by the lecturer to be speak or say something. Yeah, this is kind of like uh, the culture buratri. So, yeah, but uh, I've I've learned about uh, to change the culture is difficult as to change like the the world. <laughs> so, I think what we can do in this issue that we have to. Uh, be more like um, uh, encourage from the small level, for example, for the young generation, how to encourage them to be more, come on, please uh, be more active and please uh, to give your own opinion, to speak up, your to express your feeling and your interest. I think that's more important. So, um, yeah. Um, it it is not impossible. Maybe in the future, uh, there will be a change in the our culture for the people, for the public to be can give can be uh, more brave to speak and to give their expression. Okay. As we continue our discussion, I kindly remind all the participants to fill the attendance form in the meeting chat. So don't forget to fill the attendance form. And other question, maybe in this room, like Miss Ami, uh, no Asia. Okay, there's a question, please. Uh, okay, good morning, everyone. My name is Deandara Iskandar, and I have uh, one question, but uh, I want if Professor Molly can answer my question, but uh, 
it's about time and I can give opportunity and it doesn't matter for me. And I hope uh, Miss Ami can answer my question. Uh, my question is how to identify an option for peaceful resolution or hostility between local rebels and the government using empirical testing because Professor Molly states for empirical testing and because there are still highly sensitive issues in Indonesia between local groups and the government that are difficult to resolve through conversation or agreement in any form. Uh, to be more precisely, I mean in Papua. And we can do resolve the problem if we want to conversation or agreement in any form. And if empirical testing uh, from Professor Molly, when Professor Molly stayed for step, and I mean, if it doesn't work, to we we are adoption one of empirical testing, and it will we start over, and we will ma eh, we must try another option and again and again and it will be a long to reach peaceful right uh i mean if miss ami uh sorry <laughs> uh ini uh me is okay <laughs> miss ami uh bisa menangkap pertanyaan saya gitu Uh, identify empirical testing from Professor Molly. Uh, uh, wait a minute. Uh, uh, Professor Molly states if the national framework for peace, uh, cross national instance or economic re reincorporation in treaties and their outcomes, and the second, peace through entrepreneurship, and third, Peace through civil society and for peace in urban American. And uh, this is uh, difficult if we we adoption in problem in our sector. I mean in Indonesian. Uh. <laughs> yeah, I mean how to identify one of us uh, option and it will be clearly to resolve uh, what uh, uh Chris Ruth. ah that's it nangkep ya okay i'll try whether this is uh in indonesian <laughs> yeah Maybe you can, I mean, we can mix with Bahasa if you feel, I also if I feel um, difficult to find the words, sometimes kind of, sometimes we blank, yeah? Uh, so your question is about how to identify the the option, yeah? The option in terms of the concept of the grassroots, yeah? To... Empirical testing. To? Empirical testing. Uh... Uh, like in Santiago Sosa and Elisa de Amico, uh, or like uh, the problems in Colombia and Uganda, or maybe Senegal and other island. How to identify? Yeah. Rebels, okay, rebellious, okay. Uh, 
Okay. All right, uh, Dian, thank you very much for the question. Finally, I do understand what's your questions because you just wearing masks and, and so we are in the same room, it's really grumbling. <laughs> okay, so uh, the question uh, raised by Dian is about is there any other option uh, that we can do in some of um to solve the case of like rebellious community or people, for example, you mentioned about the in Papua, yeah, because uh, so far those those solution from like a discussion or agreement still cannot uh solve the problem yet, yeah, something like that. Yeah, to find another option is really a big answer for me. Is really since I also not really uh, focusing on my research in this uh, area. Maybe Buratri can also give some opinions about the issue of uh, handling the conflict. But I will answer in terms of the grassroots uh, concept because uh, yeah, my previous research, most of them based on the grassroots uh, theory. As I mentioned at the beginning that uh, the grassroots theory emphasize how the process of the interaction or finding the solution come from the bottom up. Usually uh, the system, like you mentioned, uh, what government offer is mostly top-down, top-down approach. Uh, as you also mentioned, still why the problem still occur? Yeah, this is the problem because most of the ideas, most of the solution always come from the top down. Where, uh, for example, the government and other parties doesn't really understand what really, what really needs and hopes by the people. If you mention about the rebellious or other uh, groups, yeah, the group that uh, that express their unhappy or unsatisfied feeling. So if uh, we refer to some key aspect that I mentioned before about uh, the grassroots theory, there are, I mentioned about six, yeah? Uh, the community empowerment, the local solution, the participatory decision-making, the social capital, the advocacy and awareness, and the other one, uh, the conflict resolution itself. Yeah, we, Maybe we can here we can propose one of the strategy from this key aspect. Uh, if, for example, the community empowerment, yeah, if you ask for another option, we can ask the people whether the the community rebellious community or rebellious group are already given the uh, the opportunity to, to empower themselves yet. If they if they feel that no, we haven't give, uh, given the opportunity, the opportunity. So this is the answer. They have to uh, given the um, the the opportunity. Like I said before, please give the the moment to them to access what are they really want and need. Uh, actually, if we refer to the case of. Papua, like you said, is really sensitive issue actually because yeah, we have to be carefully. Um, I think the approach from the we can combine the approach or the strategy, community empowerment, and the local wisdom, the local solutions. Try, please try to understand um, what is the values, the beliefs that uh, the people, um, like we said. Pegang, yeah, they, they hold. When we understand their value and their beliefs, if we refer again to the other 
aspect of the grassroots about the social capital. This is the process when we try to bridge to bridge uh, the connection, the relationship between the local people and us as the outsiders. We have to to answer your question. We have to ask our own self to ask the government. Have we done this strategy, this moment yet? To understand, to know, to bridge, to bond with them. Yeah. Um, if we also refer to the small case, for example, like for example, when you we have a problem with our friend, yeah. Sometimes we have our own opinion and feeling. Hmm, this guy's like this and like that. We don't know yet what is the real feeling and for example opinion until we try to sit together and try like we talk heart by heart i don't know in the english or dari hati ke hati we talk heart by heart to understand but in the context to solve the conflict between local community or local people of course we have to bring this a, a bit uh, how to say a bigger issue so try to live with them to understand how their values and their beliefs until they they want to open their mind they want to open themselves to be feel comfortable okay you are part of us and this is my expectation yeah for me that's uh the thing that yeah we hope this more can be more effective to Soft. We try. We never know if we never try, right? Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Ami. Yes, I think uh, there is a online participant who want to ask. Is there any participant who raised their hand? Here in this room, is there any question? Yeah. I, okay, think one, uh, I may want to uh, add to your response, uh, Bu Ami, if, you, if, you're, uh, if you're giving me an opportunity to. So uh, about Dian's question, I think is a very interesting question, right? I mean, he pay attention to the mechanism that was proposed by Dr. Molly in her book, right? There are four kind of like um, avenues. It's uh, the hypothesis that's being tested empirically through cases. So one, two, three um, that I noticed from um, those cases really uh, focus on how the urban and non-urban settings also can be a determinant. For instance, the last case she mentions about the, the urban, the urban means uh, the cases in Chicago. And then she also mentioned the first case in Northern Ireland, and then the second or the three, third is about the Ugandan. So um, how to build a peaceful kind of like consensus through the communities, to me, we can also need to see how those kind of setting, urban, non-urban, and also how the ethnic, religious, and also identity uh, affiliations or fraction um, that we needs to take it into account, because we cannot we cannot address one issue just to one particular communities. Uh, the way that I would like to put it is this way. Communities is a big thing, right? But communities, what's inside the communities is matters. How fractionalized them. 
how big the group. There is the minority, there is the majority, right? So the way we need to address, I mean, we need to know exactly like the Papua, this very sensitive case, right? In Papua, you cannot just say Papua because there are a lot of tribes within Papua itself. So there are like a big tribe and there are smaller tribes. So the way we have to understand through empirical testing is that which one or which two or three groups that we need to approach and build, empower them so they understand that this is our communities, like bigger problem, not only one or two groups that needs to get attention. So by building a greater kind of like self-awareness among the group, I think that's the bargaining that those people can propose or ask international to pay attention to them. And then by increasing that position to negotiate with the government, then the government also can understand, okay, so we need to approach you instead of others. A lot of noises then that happening in Papua. So we need to be careful by, for instance, dividing the territories itself to us now, it doesn't resolve the problem, right? Papua is already divided through uh, Pemekaran. Now we have how many provinces? So looking at the point where it's already divided and then divided again, we see that it doesn't resolve the problem. There is still conflict happening up there. So this is very delicate kind of like um, approach that Dr. Uh, Molly or Molly is uh, proposing and she wants to test it out because the the, the nor normative arguments that um, probably happening in uh, Northern Ireland and many of the uh, researchers that uh, using uh, Northern Ireland is a very uh, a unique cases that many people also always refer, like scholars refer that to a very um, uh, um, a case that we need to look into how the peace or negotiations uh, can be resolved through the community. As she mentions about one thing that this is not really complicated if, right, if we're taking into account to the shared goals, mutual awareness, I guess, that needs to be built. Because in Northern Ireland, there's like groups uh, divided um, based on the religions, right? And there are also groups um, divided by their uh, ethnicities or um, affiliations to particular group. So um, if you're taking that into a uh, Indonesian case, there's another avenue that we need to uh, look which kind of uh, approach that can be useful or helpful to empower the communities because we want to build something from the roots or from the ground, uh, from a bottom up participation rather than solely depend to the government, right? So yeah, there's a one way to understand. And then in Chicago, I would love to hear uh, from Molly about the case in Chicago itself because America today, there's a lot of racial tension especially in the upcoming uh, elections and how these particular um, communities within the Chicago area. Chicago is very complex, uh, by the way, uh, because there are uh, a lot of uh, like a uh, racist um, uh, tensions going on. And then also uh, the communities are also uh, pretty much divided by uh, where they're coming from. So there is the Ukrainian village, there's Italian village, there is the Indian, some people said little Indian, and then there's Muslim societies, and uh, how they built this kind of thing to prevent from uh, violent conflicts uh, that uh, maybe uh, uh, they will uh, confront in the future. How this movement from under, from the grassroots itself, can uh, help sustain uh, Chicago for, um, I mean, not becoming something that uh, people predicted that it will be uh, erupted in a more violent 
situations. That's probably one insight that I, I can add again. The adoption um, is not that easy if we haven't really nailed down the problem within the community system. I hope it clears enough. I think there is there is still no question in this meeting. So we hope in this room are there still anyone who want to ask or give opinion about this topic. Okay, uh, please let your name and question or opinion. Yes. Uh, good morning and thank you for the change for this morning. And I think it's interesting about talking about peace and prosperity. And uh, Buami said, about bonding and leading in actors and i think uh indonesia about indonesia and bonding and leading is masih kurang uh, so my question is what if the government or the actors doesn't coordinate well because maybe they are still avoiding about transparency or just protecting their positions and Will peace be achieved or it's just about dreams? And do you think Indonesia has achieved real peace? Thank you. Uh, sorry, what's your name again? Mutia. Muti. Okay, Muti. It's very interesting question. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, talking about in our context here yeah, in Indonesia, um, how government, when if, if government cannot coordinate well, so whether it's still there, the peace, yeah, here, yeah. Um, to answer this question, maybe we need to have a look at our own surrounding. Yeah, maybe I can uh, give you a question like: Do you feel safe in your surrounding at the moment? Sometimes, <laughs> so there there is another time that you don't feel safe. Uh, why you feel like that? So maybe what Muti said here represent the other uh, groups of people or in, I mean the other group of communities as well where where we feel that why we as a citizen doesn't feel fully safe to live in our surrounding. Yeah, so to answer your question whether peace in Indonesia, whether it's still there or not, um, if we refer to our uh undang undang dasar what we can say the ha constitution thank you Ratri. our constitution that uh, the peace is part of 
our commitment. Not only we want to guarantee the peace in our own country, but also we would like to involve in the world peace. So if we refer to this constitution, we know that uh, the government has a high commitment to do this, to, to create this peace situation. Um, but the problem is when in terms of the implementation, we see that not all the government regulation or the system that created by the government uh, fit fit with the situation. For example, like you you mentioned about the criminality that um, I think a lot of uh, cases happen, especially in big city like in Jakarta or in Surabaya, uh, Medan, and other big cities. Um, we feel that we but, but, yeah, the government still has to do a lot of things, but again, if we only rely on government, like what I said in the early about the top-down approach, still I can guarantee the problem is still there. So this is the point that we as a community, we as the part of the um, how to say part of the state, yeah, as a citizen, we have to participate, we have to involve in creating the peace itself. Please don't rely on the government to create the peace. But what can we contribute to create the peace in our own surrounding? For example, what we can see, yeah, like um uh if you know the system in previous time, we call it a syscom link. I think we can we can count it how many um uh, how many neighborhood has still or still has kind of the system the sis coming system maybe we can count it by our own finger it means that not many um area or neighborhood still have uh this kind of system F people now tend to be an individual style, individual uh, system, and this is kind of a problem. So uh, if we refer to the Gresu theory, how uh, the, one of the key aspects about the social capital, yeah, the uh, government and also the public or community has to combine, has to coordinate, has, has to work hand in hand to create a peaceful, to create peace in the surrounding by increasing the social capital. The social capital is really, uh, we can we call it the capital itself as a social. It comes from the bottom up. It comes from our own surrounding. Yeah. So again, uh, referring to your question, so peace in whether it's still peace in our country, yes, but to some extent, it means that we need to rearrange, we need to uh, improve the system because, like what your testimony just now, you feel that only safe in some parts, but the others not really. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Reba, I hope this answered your question. Uh, thank you, Mrs. Ami. And uh, I think we approach the end of uh, today's lecture, ladies and gentlemen. I think it's time to close our lecture today. And uh, I would like to extend our gratitude to our participants, both online and offline, for your participation. Please applause for all of us uh, in our lecture today on a grassroots theory of peace and prosperity. We also uh, extend our gratitude and appreciation for our speaker, Professor Molly Milan and Milan and and Dr. Hidayatul Rahmi for your insight to our lecture today to give us knowledge and please give a big applause for our speaker. 
Uh, we hope this lecture has been source of inspiration and knowledge for all of us. Thank you for your active involvement and your commitment to uh, seeking this lecture to the end. With that, I'd like to bring our event to a close. Thank you for being part of this international lecture. We look forward to seeing you at our next lecture. And 9 November as we continue to explore and learn together uh, have a wonderful day thank you very much thank you Ms. Rita. thank you everyone assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh Okay, uh, the last reminder is please fill the attendance form to get the certificate. Yes, also for this offline attendance participant, please fill the attendance form. Have you got the attendance form? datang di Politeknik ST Yalan, Jakarta. Kampus kami menerapkan protokol kesehatan bagi setiap mahasiswa, dosen, dan tamu yang berkunjung. Agar selalu aman dan nyaman untuk beraktivitas dan kuliah. Belajar di Politeknik ST Yalan, Jakarta menjadi pilihan terbaik untuk membangun karir di masa depan. Kampus dengan 10 keunggulan. Menyelenggarakan pendidikan yang siap kerja, perguruan tinggi milik pemerintah, kesempatan mendapatkan beasiswa, biaya terjangkau, terbuka kesempatan menjadi aparatur sipil negara, tenaga pengajar yang kompeten, perkuliahan yang berbasis IT, serta magang di instansi pemerintah, BUMN dan BUMD, serta di pihak swasta. Green Campus di pusat Jakarta, dan jaringan alumni yang ada di kementerian, lembaga, swasta, dan pemerintah. Kuliahnya bisa hybrid loh, bisa daring dan luring. Yuk kita intip kuliah malam ya! Kalau mau pintar, harus sering ke perusahaan. Yuk! Ada yang sedang latihan work climbing juga nih. Yuk lihat. Jam pendidikan di Politeknik STI Alan Jakarta memberikan pengalaman yang sangat berharga bagi saya selaku aparatur sipil negara di lingkungan pemerintah Provinsi DKI Jakarta dalam penguatan karakter memberikan Semangat perubahan menuju Indonesia yang lebih maju. Your only limit is your mind. Perkuliahan ini membawa spirit perubahan dalam hidup saya. Saya menjadi lebih persisten, gigih, dan berkomitmen. Semangat untuk terus mengembangkan diri dengan terus belajar, mengasah kemampuan, dan pengalaman adalah kunci yang menjadi insan profesional yang kompeten, tangguh, dan unggul. Melanjutkan kuliah setelah bekerja sebagai profesional menjadi pilihan terbaik saya untuk mengembangkan diri. Penting bagi saya untuk mengakselerasi kemampuan untuk lebih maju. Satu hal yang mendorong saya melanjutkan kuliah pada program studi doktoral administrasi pembangunan negara di Politeknik STI Alan Jakarta adalah untuk mendukung karir saya sebagai pejabat fungsional analis kebijakan ahli media. Sistem pengajaran dan perkuliahan di Politeknik Setialan disusun dengan mengedepankan konsep kepemimpinan untuk membentuk karakter pemimpin-pemimpin di bidang pemerintahan yang unggul di masa depan.
seru-seru kan aktivitasnya? Ditunggu di Politeknik ST Yalan, Jakarta. Sudah siap berubah? Ayo berubah. 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 Lebih baik. Lebih unggul. Lebih unggul.